dragons are very animal-like mythical creatures and may just be inspired by perhaps a couple of real-life animals. Can you guess which one? Spend the next 20 minutes feeding your brain with Formosa Fauna so you can learn all about the animal kingdom and become smarter than all of your friends. Because what better way to spend your commute or downtime? Every Friday is Formosa Fauna Friday. I'm Tristan Hildurand, the voice of Formosa Fauna. I love animals and I love talking about animals. The contest I mentioned where you can send in a letter with a picture and have a chance to win a box of merchandise, animal centric merchandise, is still live and I'll give you an update about it later in this episode. I have gotten an email or two as well, so we do have a little bit to share, but I'll put that towards the end. Today I want to talk to you about the origin of the dragon. I think that's a little bit funny because it sounds like the name of a spiral game, doesn't it? But we're talking about how a mythological creature such as the dragon came to be. Dragons are very animal-like and were inspired by perhaps a couple of real-life animals. Can you guess which ones? I'll let you think about some possibilities as I briefly share an animal-related current event. Have you ever heard of the Taiwanese pangolin? These animals bear a resemblance to armadillos and anteaters. They have brown hard scales covering one side of their body and are about 30 inches or 76 centimeters long. Just a couple of weeks ago, there was a Taiwanese pangolin born at a Czech zoo, making the baby pangolin the second to be born in captivity in Europe. The female pango pup is healthy and steadily gaining weight. Two pangolins were loaned as part of a program initiated in 2022 after Taipei and Prague became sister cities. The two who made the trip over to Europe are the female Taiwanese pangolin Runho Tang, Cough Drop, and her maid Guo Bao, Precious Fruit. They had their last pangolin baby, Shishka, which means pine cone, last year. Prague Zoo, along with the Leipzig Zoo in Germany, is among the few European zoos to house Taiwanese pangolins. The primary goal since receiving the pangolins was to ensure their health and well-being, and the birth of two pango pups within a year and a half has exceeded many of scientists' and conservationists' expectations. Breeding pangolins in captivity is challenging due to their specific dietary needs and environmental requirements. The successful births highlight the zoo's dedication and importance of international collaboration in Taiwanese pangolin conservation efforts. A bit of good news is always a good appetizer before we dig into the main course, so back to the dragons! Interestingly enough, dragons have appeared independently in the art, mythology, and folklore of many cultures and civilizations throughout history. Iran, Persia, Egypt, Greece, and China are only some of the countries where dragons have made an appearance in the arts. In Asia specifically, first appearances date way back. Dragons first appeared in Japanese mythology as far back as 680 AD and even longer ago around the Shang Dynasty in China from 1766 to 1122 BC. Japanese dragons are believed to be the ancestors of the first emperor of Japan, holding importance and significance as a symbol for the emperor. In particular, the five-clawed dragon, considered to be godlike, is said to have been worn on robes only by nobles and is therefore highly respected and honored in Japanese society. There is a well-known legend about a dragon king who is said to live in a pond at the emperor's imperial garden of Kyoto. During times of drought in ancient times, Buddhist monks held rituals there to persuade the dragon king to rise up and bring rain. Perhaps this is why the area's dragon is associated with having full control over having a good harvest and representing the wealth and abundance of the region. When I lived in Japan, I had a teacher tell me that the origin of the Japanese depiction of a dragon came from travelers who had returned from other regions of the world and tried to explain a different animal, the lion. Having not seen a lion before, the fiery mane and tail with pom-pom like tufts at the end or the ferocious nature was hard to depict for artists and seemed very mystical. 
So they ended up accidentally creating dragons. I had that story in my mind for the longest time and I believed it, but now that I look into it, I, I can't find anything anywhere that says that. So I don't think that may be true. In the most common Chinese depiction, the dragon is composed using different parts of real animals. In the latter half of the Han Dynasty, scholar Wang Fu described the nine anatomical components of a dragon as follows. Head of a camel, antlers of a deer, eyes of a rabbit, also translated as demon, ears of a cow, neck of a snake, belly of a clam, scales of a carp, claws of a hawk, and foot pads of a tiger. That sounds like what I would tell a police sketch artist if I saw a dragon and needed to explain it but couldn't draw it out myself. There are all sorts of versions of the story trying to answer how the dragon originated online, including the most simple one, snake. That's it. Snake. Period. That particular theory comes from ancient Greek, the word dracon, which re <laughs> that did not sound like Greek. I don't know Greek, which referred to giant snakes. In temples in Taiwan, depictions of the dragon are carved or painted on roof ornamentation, pillars, balustrades, window lattices, door shutters, and decorative features such as candles and lamps. They are, however, found significantly less in places outside of temples. This sounds off topic, but we will circle back around and it is very relevant. Have you ever seen the Kung Fu Panda animation? The reason I bring this up is because a while back, netizens had pointed out that for some reason the animation seems much more Chinese American than it did Chinese. There was some American aspect about it that was creeping itself in and people couldn't quite place it. I uncovered the potential reason while watching a video by Accented Cinema on YouTube. In that video, they pointed out the sheer amount of dragons that appear throughout the movie in every sort of scenario in every location. Whether it's the training grounds that have two large golden dragon statues, or the pokey wooden training dummies the main character uses to train with, being shaped as dragons. As Accented Cinema puts it, the amount of dragons is one of the reasons this film looks Chinese to everyone except Chinese people. Even real Chinese films rarely have dragons making an appearance, even in the most glamorous of scenes. Likely because dragons are such divine, sacred beasts often representing royalty. In 1906, large parts of San Francisco, including Chinatown, were demolished in a major earthquake. Chinatown didn't have the best rep with locals, it would appear, as the city took advantage of this destruction to try to relocate Chinatown. At the top of one of the articles in a newspaper, it read, San Francisco may be freed from the standing menace of Chinatown. According to how Accent and Cinema recalls how events transpired, to protect the area, a group of Chinese merchants had to hire white architects to rebuild the neighborhood into a tourist attraction, an exotic locale that appeals to the Western fascination of China. Dragons then appeared everywhere. So there is no one singular good answer for what the dragon is based on, and just as the lore for how the dragon got started goes way back, I'm sure theories about what it's based on or how it came to be also differs by region. An incident occurred in New Taipei City's Shulin District where a black dog was discovered with its mouth taped shut, leading to severe injuries including infected wounds that had rotted down to the bone, leaving the dog in a dire condition. Somebody passing by the area found the dog and rescued them by taking them to a local veterinary clinic where the dog received intensive treatment. Vicious, feral animals typically won't let humans get close enough to do something like put tape around their snout, which suggests this dog was perhaps not vicious or feral and could have been betrayed by someone they trusted. In relation to this case, Animal Protection and Health Inspection Office veterinarian Li Chin Pei said abused animals often develop distrust of humans. This dog, however, displayed signs of affection and gratitude towards its rescuers. So while such injury may have been very devastating, the poor pup did not lose hope. 
In an effort to create a more compassionate new Taipei city, authorities are urging the public to do the same and report any signs of animal abuse they may come across. The good news is, thanks to the intervention and extensive medical care, the black dog is now on the road to recovery. The veterinary team has reported significant improvements in the dog's condition, even putting them up for adoption. This incident has sparked a wave of empathy and concern among the residents of New Taipei, highlighting the importance of animal welfare and the need for stricter enforcement of laws to protect vulnerable animals from abuse and neglect. Of course, you should never use tape to muzzle or restrain dogs. This practice violates Article 6 of the Animal Protection Act, which prohibits animal harassment, abuse, or injury. Violators face up to two years in prison and fines ranging from 200,000 NT dollars or 6,100 US dollars all the way up to 2 million NT dollars or 61,000 US dollars. If you come across this situation and you would like to report it, call as you should, call the Animal Protection Hotline at 1959. Again, very simple, four numbers, 1959. If you see something, say something. This situation reminds me of something I saw while traveling in Taiwan once. It's not directly a story about animal abuse, so you don't have to worry about it getting gruesome or that sad, I guess. I was just traveling in Hotong. It's known Hodong. It's known as the Cat Village in Taiwan and is a very cute and quaint place. It's also located in northern Taiwan in New Taipei, and it's said that the cat population is 200 times that of the human population. Uh, having been there, I don't think that's quite true, unless there are very, very few people living there. There are dozens of cats who live in the area surrounding this train station, and I'm sure there's a whole history behind how the cat village of Hodong came to be, but basically what we need to know for this story is that it attracts a decent amount of tourists to the area. Essentially, if you're headed to that town, 99 times out of 10, ah, 99 times out of 10, I mean accurate, 99 times out of 10, I'm running with it, it will be because of the cats. The residents and business owners there have really embraced that, and you will see cat-themed everything, from the food and drinks, to souvenirs, to art, paint on the concrete walls lining the sidewalks, everything is cat-themed. I remember there's an overpass bridging two sides of the area, and along the inside of the overpass there are walls that have little platforms for the cats to run around and play or rest on. So being an animal lover, I showed up there for either the first or second time and was minding my own business when I saw a woman trying to take a picture with one of the dogs in the area. There are quite a few stray dogs in the area that are on good terms with the cats. Uh, the dog did not like her though and kept walking away. She got mad when she couldn't take the picture that she wanted, so she pulled out a rubber band and tried to get the dog to approach her so she could put the rubber band around the dog's neck. I don't even need to or want to tell you the connotation of that action or what the consequences could be. It's disgusting and it's disturbing. Especially if you're a tourist, you're in their territory. You can interact respect respectfully, but also listen to the signs that they're giving you about whether or not they want to be approached, interacted with, touched, etc. If they don't like it, don't push it. This is very basic logic, right? The animals may be what you came for, but they do not serve you. I just remember being so furious that I was about to burst out in tears. So how about we just show some respect? In other news, the Taipei Zoo recently celebrated the birth of a Malayan tapir calf. The calf was reported to be healthy and slightly larger than the mother Molly's previous offspring. The father of the calf, Moko, passed away last year. Despite initial concerns about the calf's positioning, close monitoring, and ultrasound examinations confirmed the impending birth, resulting in a successful delivery. Zoo officials reported that the calf remained calm during its initial weight check and showed no visible abnormalities. The birth marks a significant event for the zoo given the challenges faced during the pregnancy, including the need for careful monitoring and ultrasound scans. This new addition to the zoo's family underscores the importance of diligent care and observation in ensuring the health and well-being of both the mother and her offspring. 
In a dramatic display of loyalty and intelligence, a dog in Oregon trekked nearly four miles to find help after its owner's truck plummeted off of a cliff. Brandon Garrett and his four dogs were in a remote mountainous area when the accident occurred, leaving Garrett immobilized at the crash site. The following morning, one of his dogs made its way back to their campsite and alerted Garrett's family, who then contacted authorities. This led to a successful rescue operation, with Garrett being airlifted to a hospital. Man's best friend? I'd say so. We have a dog-related story sent in by listener Sherry. Thank you so much for writing an email and sending it in. I My door is always open in terms of sending emails to Tristan at rti.org.tw so you can share your stories and photos. Uh, let's get into this. I'm just going to read it exactly how Sherry put it, but there are some adorable photos in here. I'll try to put it on the RTI English website with this post. Hopefully it'll work. Here's the title of this email. It says, My American Gentleman and Me. Growing up, I never had pets, so the journey into the world of dog ownership was entirely new to me. Bill, my husband, on the other hand, had always been a Boston Terrier owner, even before we got married. When I first met Bill in 2010, he had two older Boston Terriers, Spike and Avra, who were brother and sister. When Spike passed away, we decided to bring on a little companion to be with Avra. When I first met Dino, I never imagined how much a small, reserved Boston Terrier could change my life. Dino was lighter and smaller than most Boston Terriers, with a timid disposition that immediately endeared him to us. A few months later, Avra also got ill and we had to let her go so she didn't need to suffer. We returned to the same breeder and that's when we met Frisco. As it turned out, Frisco was Dino's nephew though he was bigger and had a completely different personality. They are yin and yang. Where Dino was shy and reserved, Frisco was outgoing and loved people. His infectious energy filled our home with laughter and joy. These pictures are adorable. I see a little speckled chest on the white Boston Terrier, right? Very small, I think this is a little pup pic. Frisco's enthusiasm is boundless. He's convinced that every visitor is there solely to see him, and he greets them with the enthusiasm of a long-lost friend. Dino, on the other hand, often gives me the look that says, are we really doing this? Before he retreats to his favorite <laughs> quiet spot. Every day with Dino and Frisco is an adventure. Whether it's watching Dino cautiously explore new treats or seeing Frisco shadow me everywhere I go with unbridled enthusiasm, they remind me how loving and joyful the world of dogs can be. They've turned me into a true dog lover, a title I wear proudly thanks to my wonderful husband and our beloved American gentleman, Boston Terriers. It is so amazing to me that I've worked with so many different animals and they're not able to speak to us so they can't have their like linguistic quirks or interests and, and hobbies and yet their personalities are so drastically different. I've never met two of like the same animal, you know? So I totally get it even though if you get the same breed of dog they might look similar but they're definitely going, they're going to be completely different in terms of personality. I think it's so lovely that you have had such good luck with all your Boston Terriers and that they've just blended and become a lovely part of your family. I know it is so hard uh, going through losing and having to make the choice to put down your animal when, when they get sick, but you just have to be reminded that you gave them the best the best life they possibly could have had. Thank you so much, Sherry, for sending that in. I appreciate it, it is so cool. As far as our contest goes, at the time of recording this episode, I have not yet received a letter. Maybe they're all stuck in the mail, or nobody thought that they were fast enough, and now that we're a couple weeks in, people are like, there's no way somebody must have sent a letter in. If you're thinking about sending a letter in, send a letter in, I'll send you something back, okay? Thank you for listening to Formosa Fauna. Making it to the end of an episode makes you a Formosa Fauna friend. It's not gross, it's cute. All animals require enrichment, and Formosa Fauna is just that. After all, we're all just a bunch of wild animals. See you next time for Formosa Fauna Fridays here on Radio Taiwan International. <laughs>